Do you think we're about ready? Okay. Um, I need your help. Uh, desperately need your help because I'm about to do a talk about networking and I'm in a meetup for a bunch of people to talk about open source. So I need to calibrate myself. Uh, otherwise you might be very bored or overwhelmed or something and therefore this might be problematic. So please, uh, unlike Glynn, I get this over with up the start, up the, up the beginning. Who knows what WWW means? Hands up. Okay, cool. IoT. DNS. TCP IP. TCP port number. Peer to peer. End to end. Bit lower there. IPsec. Cool. Seven layer model. Cool, this is doing good. MAC address. Hooray, right. this is going to be easier than I was worried about. Address resolution protocol, gratuitous ARP. Okay, starting to fade a little bit. BGP. GSLB. No, oh, okay, that's right. DNSRR. DNS round robin. Okay, cool. Uh, a logical link. Some, right. Packet switched. Circuit switched. ARPA. Fuzzball. <laughs> what? Okay. <laughs> X25 NSAP. Thank God for that. Some people are that old. Unix. Yay. Okay. Where are we? So, this is a presentation called How and Why You Should Use Onion Networking. There are two things which I find terribly fascinating about the old internet, which we've just done a little bit of a walk around. Firstly, in the beginning, the internet communication, uh, of communication, the way we did communication on the internet, was all what we would now call end to end. It's a bit like peer-to-peer, -peer, but there's only two of you. Because, you know, if you have something that only has two ends, it's a rope, not a network. So here is an ARPA net logical map from 1977. This is a little bit older than what I was actually going to be, or the timeline I'm going to actually be talking about. But it serves for purposes of illustration. It's a pretty map. And if we have on the left Alice, who is A, and she's at Stanford on a PDP-11, and we have Bob at NYU on the right using a PDP-11 also, if they are communicating with each other, there is a direct communication, a direct link between the pair of them. They probably have a TCP connection and they're using um, user bin talk, Y talk, something like that from that era. There would be no firewalls. There would be no intermediaries upon which they would have to rendezvous in order to communicate. They would have direct communication with each other. There would be no men in the middle. There would be no impediments to communications. And this would actually work. Uh, let's not dwell on the network security of the era, though, because we didn't have firewalls, and the software was kind of shoddily written. <clears throat> and there was very little in the way of cryptography, because it was all export controlled by the United States government and other things like that. Um, so things are better now than they are then, sort of, sometimes, in certain respects. Secondly, the most important thing about software of that era was that you had to have embarrassing command names like user UCB finger. Uh, because if, especially, yeah, don't say this to an Australian, it's kind of rude for them. Um, I ran up a 4.3 BSD machine on an emulator so I could get some screenshots. And this is the finger program, the manual page for it. Finger was a daemon, a listener, a server that would run on basically every machine on the internet, approximately. And it acted as what we would nowadays call presence. The ability to have a little red dot saying so-and-so is not currently logged in, or a green dot saying that Glid is currently logged in. It afforded that kind of thing for people during the green text era of internet. Uh, it ran on port number 79. And... I think that this is not a coincidence that the web is on port 80. Because one of the interesting things about Finger was that as part of its presence mechanism, like when you have a WhatsApp status nowadays saying, you know, I'm going to the restaurant or something, or please use another mes uh, messenger app whatsoever to contact me, Finger allowed you to create two files, .plan and .project, in your home directory. And whatever was in those files was presented as this is a project or this is a plan to whoever fingered you across the breadth of the internet. This was a kind of proto-blogging. It was a personal communications opportunity. Um, if you typed 
finger at root at localhost or root at other machines somewhere on the other side of the internet or whatever Glenn was on hacking on back in those days, you could put a lot of text into the uh, dot plan file. Uh, so much so that John Carmack, the guy who wrote Doom, a popular game of the era and before or after even, um, used to have what we would now recognize as a blog in his plan file. He would just keep on adding to the top the latest things that he was doing when he was hacking on software, and people could get a status about what he was up to over the internet via this means. It also meant that you could do a sort of prototypical, what we now have as flash animations, because it allowed carriage return and line feed and space and backspace and so forth to be sent as part of the file contents. And if you knew that somebody was reading this on a 9600 board glass teletype, you could actually send characters at enough of a bit rate to have a kind of animation type effect such as this. I'll let this run for a little minute. The timing is all done by sending enough carriage returns to pad out the byte stream being sent to the screen. And if you want to see how that finishes, there's a YouTube video, which I can point you at later, grab me afterwards. Um, so, as it says here, this is from the Hacker's Dictionary. Systems that support finger the plan file in a home directory is displayed when the user is fingered. So, this is where I want to get to, is that there was direct communication from a client to a server with no intermediaries. We didn't need to have some website somewhere to provide presence mechanisms or communications or bloggy type things. So I want to make an assertion for the rest of this presentation that end-to-end -end networking aids innovation in distributed computing, it aids information sharing, and it helped make the internet as we know it today. My justification for this statement is we are here today. Uh, this is how we got here, and it seems to have worked. So why do I recommend using onion networking? Uh, if you haven't come across it, I'm about to explain what it is, but I want to just give the high-level uh, description. Uh, if you have encountered onion networking before, you've probably heard of it spoken as you have a community, uh, you have an audience, somebody you want to reach and communicate with. Their access to content is hampered. They may live in a country where there is censorship or repression, where they're not allowed to get at news media and other things like that. There may be a risk of fake websites. If you're accessing a website, it may have been hacked. It's not the real Twitter, that kind of thing. And it, you need private, you need assured connections to these websites in order to be certain that you are not receiving pro propaganda, inter being interfered with, something like that. From a technical standpoint, though, for the geeks in the audience, I find it much more compelling to think of it like this. We are building disintermediated, distributed end-to-end -end tools, like the finger command, but for the modern day. There's things like onion share for sharing files from one machine to another without having to worry about firewalls being in the way and without having to worry about giving a copy of your data to anyone else. There's an application called Briar, which is a messaging platform based around these theses. It's a little bit uptight about security, but it sort of is shooting in the right direction. Um, or alternately, you're building IoT systems and you want home automation and you don't want to have to deal with either having a permanent AWS machine set up in which to rendezvous stuff or you don't want to have to worry about firewalls and other things getting in the way wherever you might be in the world. If you haven't heard about onion networking before, some people call it the dark web. <laughs> but Facebook are on it, I know because I built that. The New York Times are on it, and I know because I built that too. Uh, BuzzFeed, I did not build that one, they built that one themselves. And ProPublica, who actually in, were one of the early uh, news sources to get an Onion address and for people to be able to reach them directly and with a high degree of assurance, were also on it. Cloudflare, DNS provider, are actually offering DNS resolution services via DNS over HTTPS over Onion. And they also have done Onion acceleration for all of their traffic. If you are a Cloudflare customer and you click a little button, suddenly anyone who accesses your website over Tor gets, go, gets to go a lot faster. So it's not the dark web anymore. It is actually, I consider it more, the more secure web. It is a logical progression in network protocol evolution. 
So again, the traditional sh social value of Onion is that you have a connection to the genuine Facebook. This is the Facebook Onion address, Facebook core www.onion, and that is definitely Facebook who owned that one. Uh, it is highly available, it's highly private, it's hard to surveil. So if you're trying to read news or talk to your family or something like that, it can't be tampered with, blocked or interfered with. And there are fewer digital footprints, fewer cookies and things to clean up off of your uh, computer afterwards. It sort of reduces your digital exhaust trail. The technical value of Onion will come in the second half of the presentation. That's why we're all here. Um, to fill in the gaps, though, because inevitably people might have these questions in, at the end of the talk, so I thought I'd do it in the middle. Um, can you get it for all the platforms? The answer is yes. Mac, Win Windows, and Linux come with a uh, Tor and Onion capable web browser. It's uh, part of their offering. You can get that free software download. Uh, and Android and iOS both have platforms which allow you to access Onion websites. Uh, here is a picture because I, only, I already have one video in this presentation. I didn't want to put a second one in. Here's a picture of me playing a video on the NYT Onion site using my phone, which is down there. Um, it doesn't take an awful lot of resource to run Onion sites. In fact, it's highly efficient software. I'm exceedingly impressed at how uh, efficient, how much throughput you can get out of a single Tor daemon. Um, and so I run it on a stack of Raspberry Pis for development so I can simulate an enterprise environment with load balancing and other things like that. Also because it's cute. Um, so I've used the word onion a lot. What is this onion thing all about? What is dot onion? Uh, dot onion is the top, le whoops, top level domain of the onion namespace. And when I say namespace, I'm defining namespace as an address and what it looks like and what it means. So we've got uh, IPv4 addresses, and everybody knows they look like 10.0.0.1, something like that. Yes? Yay, OK. Uh, IPv6, uh, IPv6 addresses look like strings of hexadecimal with lots of colons in the middle. Um, DNS addresses all look like www.foo.com. And onion addresses look like some random gibberish dot onion. Um, so hand on heart, yeah, that does look like random gibberish. Reason being, it is pretty close to random. How do addresses work, though, in a namespace? Well, essentially, you type it into a web browser, magic happens, and you talk to a computer. Uh, if you've got HTTP colon slash slash 192.168.1.1, you're using IPv4 namespace and addressing. Uh, if you are using IPv6, same trick, but you have to put square brackets in because uh, Tim Berners-Lee never really had the concept of separate namespaces about IPv4 and v6 kind of being distinct from DNS. He was assuming the software would be smart enough to sort this out, essentially. Uh, turns out, not quite true. So this is a essential, essentially a flaw in HTTP. Um, www.foo.com, I think most of the people in this room know that, how that works, DNS resolution and so forth. It looks like characters. It doesn't have dots and numbers and stuff. Therefore, it's probably a DNS name. Throw it at DNS and see what happens. Then you have gibberish.onion, and it requires a Tor browser, and they all connect you to a, a remote computer, and it just looks fairly normal so far. The reason that .onion is unusual and looks like gibberish is that it's actually a raw network address. And this is a sort of interesting uh, intersection of DNS world and raw IP or networking, or raw networking in, in any form. It's exactly like 192.168.1.1 or the hexadecimal of an IPv6 address, but it's formatted to look like a DNS domain name. It has .onion on the end, and it means through this hack you can have subdomains, like www.facebookcore.onion. Compare this to IPv4. www.192.168.1.1 would not work. It would not mean anything to any browser. It's simply the two universes do not intersect in that way. But by taking the layer 3 network address, rendering it as base32, and putting the word .onion on the end of it, it looks sufficiently like a DNS domain name to be treated equitably by web browsers. So you are doing layer 3 networking that looks like uh, DNS names, and because it looks like DNS names, those go in the host header and everyone is approximately happy. You can have a reverse proxy with an onion address that is treated exactly like any website might be. 
Um, how do you choose onion addresses? Well, how do you choose addresses whatsoever? IPv4, you take what you're given from DHCP. IPv6, basically the same. DNS, you pick a name uh, and buy it, or alternately you get your lawyers to go and leverage somebody who's already domain claimed it and jumped it and buy it off of them, whatever. With onion addresses, you have to mine them, a little bit like Bitcoin. You make lots of random key generation attempts until you get something which, when rendered as a text string, looks good. It's that simple. How does it work? I'll just give you a quick flavor. It's, who here has done SSH tunneling, like putting a port, port forwarder over SSH? Basically that manner of thing. You have a layer 7 application or a daemon server uh, and uh, command line, uh, which you set up the concept of port forwarding. Port 22 on this machine goes to the other machine and then out of that into port 22 on localhost kind of thing. So this is setting up doing SSH over an onion address. It will create an onion address for you if you haven't already got one. It will just randomly generate a crypto key and go for it. Uh, and you say, I want port 22 on my onion address to go to localhost port 22. And on the other end, on my client end, you set up a SOX5 relay to be able to talk to the Tor daemon that I'm running locally. It's that simple. How do you serve Onion websites? This one I'll go through a bit quickly because this may or may not be directly relevant to talking about the things of IoT and building stuff. Uh, one, you might have a dedicated web server, have it listing on port 80 and port 443 locally, set up the appropriate port forwarding, and just let it live. Have a permanent, hard-coded Onion address. Another is you could do like Facebook did, which is to make your CMS Onion aware. It knows that it may be accessed as Facebook.com, Facebook.co.uk, Facebook.fr, if those were actually things, and also Facebook.onion. You're adding another TLD to the mix. So long as you treat that TLD in a consistent manner, you're fine. The third one is to use a shim, a man-in-the-middle proxy, which does bi-directional translation of host names from .com space to onion space. This is how the New York Times works. Um, and so, or you could just blend all of these techniques. So you've got dedicated onion servers, you've got onion-aware CMSs, you've got shims which can do this sort of thing, and you make your website more available and harder to block and harder to censor by putting it up on the dark web. There's some implementation tips, you know, uh, try not to leak stuff. Uh, you will have to get a special HTTPS certificate, which is a little bit fiddly, but people are working on making that go easy. The moment you just get an EV certificate, if you are familiar what, with what EV certificates are in SSL land. So what is the tech value here? Well, let's consider Onion networking as a layer three network. I've already explained that Onion addresses are layer three addresses, but they are just bundled up to look a little bit like DNS. If you know IP addressing and if you know how Ethernet works, uh, you know that your server publishes its IP to MAC address translation to the net using gratuitous ARP, for instance, so that it tells a distributed table. Um, if you want to talk to 129.156.1.1, send a message to this Ethernet address. Everybody with me so far? Okay. Uh, and then the client looks that up backwards, kind of, and wraps up the traffic that it wants to send and flings it at the Ethernet address. Tor, the server, publishes an onion to IP address mapping in an enormous distributed table. And when somebody wants to talk to a Tor daemon, they look up the introduction point by which they can start communication with it within a second, sir. Uh, and so you can initiate communications. And the reason I have this slide is I can literally just go back and forth and back and forth and back and forth and just sort of say, these things are approximately corresponding. They are isomorphic. Therefore, we can say that TCP IP is the layer two data link layer of onion space. It's weird to put it like that, but it does work that way. So much so that we can take the seven layer model. You see all those phrases I threw at you up front. They're all coming back to life. The seven layer model does actually map. It's just that you have to shove everything one layer down. It's almost like it's recursively encapsulated. A question. So that distributed table you're talking about, how do you know that it has to be poisoned? Ah. <laughs> Come to that in about ooh, five, six slides. Oh, yeah. 
So, onion space is also end-to-end. -end. In other words, it's a massive flat network. Who used BitNet? <laughs> okay, so yeah, so everything's in one namespace. Can get a bit crowded, but the names are really big. Like in the old V2 onion addresses, they are 80 bits. No, 40 bits. Uh, yeah, 40 bits, truncated 80 bits, right. Um, in um, the new uh, V3 onion addresses, they are the full 256-bit crypto keys. They're even larger than IPv6. They're huge. Like rendered 56 characters of uh, base 32 is huge. Um, but there are because it's a flat network and everything is reachable equally. Everybody can just like uh, on an enormous single Ethernet can connect from one to the other. There are no NATs and firewalls. There is no concept of that. Uh, the services that you want people to connect to, you publish. They are not ad hoc. I have everything listening and people may just randomly connect to port numbers until something interesting happens. Instead, you have to explicitly say, I want this port number on my machine here, or indeed, I want this port number on that machine over there to be published out to Onion Space. This is why it's a little bit more like NSAPs in X25. You actually have to go to the point of uh, publishing and describing which services you want to be accessible to the world. Question? Could that work within an internal network within an organization as well? That's a great question. I should come back to that one later. Maybe we can do that in the Q&A after. Short version is yes, but not in the way you expect. Um, so where I'm going with this is that it's like, wow. Um, we are kind of returning to the disintermediated end-to-end -end internet. Everything's flat, everything is reachable, but as I say down here, we've got kind of a consent-based networking approach. We are publishing services that are going to be accessible rather selectively rather than um, making everything hang out and then just blacklisting stuff that we are worried about. Onion space is also circuit switched. So you build up a connection between your, Tor, your local Tor client and the remote server's Tor client, um, and everything runs over that. Having established the circuit once, which is kind of a little bit slow to set up, it then gets multiplexed heavily for all subsequent TCP connections. So this means that latency for an initial connection setup to a given onion address can be a little slow, but once you're up, it's actually pretty good. You can stream HD video reasonably effectively, and sometimes there's dropouts, sometimes there aren't. It helps if you do application-side buffering or server-side buffering. Circuits sometimes break, but occasionally happens to TCP, happens a little bit more in onion space. It is, however, essentially good enough. And um, yeah, if we're back to the seven-layer model, the presentation layer of uh, onion space, of onion networking, is SOX5. It's if you can talk SOX5, you can talk to Tor. Um, it's also a rendezvous-based protocol. A lot of effort goes into making it look client-server, that I want to go from myself to Facebook's Onion site. But actually, there's a little dance that happens behind the scenes. In some ways, it's a, bit, a little bit like um, Stun and WebRTC for people who mess around in that sort of space. So, if I'm a server, yeah, step one, I'm a server, I am Facebook, I'm the New York Times, I am whatever. I go into the Tor cloud, big cloud of um, volunteer machines, and some of which are funded by do-gooding bodies of varying sorts. And I re uh, register myself, or I connect with an introduction point. Essentially, these are the listeners. These are my network interfaces inside the Tor cloud. I then cryptographically sign a descriptor of where my... Um, introduction points are. There's that cryptography thing. And the key that I use it on pertains to my onion address because that cryptographic, that little blonde, blob of randomish looking data is actually a cryptographic key. It is not a random nonce. So I sign with it and therefore I have a proof that this descriptor, which I'm about to upload into the cloud and which could otherwise be poisoned, belongs to me. Client wishes to connect to me. It must reach out to my introduction point. It says, hello, I would like to connect to you. It then establishes what it calls a rendezvous point, a sort of stepping stone somewhere else, an arbitrary place somewhere else in the Tor cloud, and sends a message to the, through the introduction point back to me saying, 
come and meet me here on the rendezvous point, and we meet in a neutral third party place. No one has absolute control of the, over the network flow. But it does mean that the client believes it has made a client to server connection. In fact, both of us have met in the middle. Two questions. The rendezvous point is still fixed. The rendezvous points migrate from minute to minute or hour to hour. They rotate, and I'm coming to that in a few slides. So what would it not be the case? Uh, no. Um, so we do rendezvous at layer 7. All of this is hidden behind a SOX 5 application for uh, some sort of presentation to other services to use. Your app thinks it's talking to a TCP stream, but it isn't. It's talking to multiplexed uh, communication cells being flung over circuits that are set up. The truth is a lot more complicated than client-server, but it's well and truly hidden. The introduction points have redundancy. There's between 1 and 10. In the next rev, rev of the um, protocol, there's between 1 and 20. Uh, they have transients, and they migrate globally. They bounce around. They change from time to time. You, you churn them. This leads to high availability, because it essentially gives you DDoS resistance, because it's hard to hit a moving target. And moreover, it's, it, it, there's a lot of controls which can be pushed by Tor into the middle of the cloud to try and uh, reduce the risk of DDoS. It has built-in global uh, server load balancing to some point. Like, admittedly, it's a bit hit and miss. But it does mean that if something bad happens in one part of the world, you, you may wind up talking to an introduction point and a circuit somewhere else in the world. It's a matter of trying to make resilient connections rather than necessarily the fastest connections. But it seems to be good enough. Um, it also has DNS round robin, effectively. You can actually register three introduction points to talk to one server and another three to talk to a different server and thereby split your load between two machines if that becomes necessary. And as I alluded to a little bit earlier, it's self-authenticating. The onion addresses are cryptographically trustable layer three network addresses. This bypasses the whole problem with IPsec with authentication headers and encapsulated security payload done as a afterthought. Instead, the actual network address is the cryptographic key or an analog of the cryptographic key to which you will be talking. And that is your cryptographic guarantee. Uh, so if you can type correctly, Facebook or dub, 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 I, you are guaranteed to be speaking, connecting to the Facebook Onion site. Into, what was this one? Oh, yeah, the other thing, as I also alluded to a little bit earlier, Tor is an over the top meta network. It doesn't care what's happening on the big internet. So if Pakistan decides it's going to hijack the whole of YouTube or somebody is going to poison BGP and reroute all the traffic through Russia, it doesn't care. Uh, so long as the nodes inside the Tor cloud can continue, continue to talk to each other, you have the assurance and you have the certainty of using that. So in an enterprise context, one of the things that I've longed to do for a long time, but I just haven't had the bandwidth, was to use Tor as a backhaul for IPsec. Because that way you have a uh, slightly slower, but still well, considerably fast enough, network for sharing PSKs or pre-shared keys amongst your IPsec cloud or something like that in order to bootstrap faster, more direct communications. Question? Are people still using IPsec? Yes, they will use it more so, especially with the mandatory age verification stuff coming from the government. It's called VPNs nowadays. So, there's a famous old saying about the internet. The, the internet treats <coughs> censorship and damage as damage and roots around it. Tor was designed with the express purpose of beating censorship in all of its forms, beating blocking in all of its forms, choking, lying about which website you're connecting to. It was built with this express intent, and it roots around it exceedingly well. If we look at the state of the modern internet, of all the bearer carriers that we have, and we look at how often we have outages and so forth, I think Tor actually may be closer to the original intention of the internet. It's like... Uh, did we forget this? Did we decide, uh, did we get slack, uh, slack and um, stop pursuing this kind of make it survive a nuclear war type approach to network design? 
Tor is perhaps a lot closer to that, I believe. Anyway, so the downsides of using Tor, a little bit, there are. I have to say, it's, it's not perfect. There is some latency and lag in circuit setups, and there are some circuit drops. These things happen. One can work around it. It's certainly good enough for the right kind of a workload, including browsing websites, doing uh, HD video. It's marvelous for doing SSH and little connections to oddball machines and things like that. Downside number two, you have to learn. Uh, a lot of the world nowadays seems to think that IP, TCP IP is the one and only network stack. Uh, this is why it's so heartening to see people recognize what X25 was um, and where this could go. But this is a separate layer three network stack. It just lives on top of the internet proper. Um, you, it's not an internal network. It's implemented it's software defined networking, I suppose, in a sense. Uh, you talk to it with SOCs, you don't talk to it with ifconfig, and it is evolving. It is a bit like 1991 all over again, where there are multiple different implementations, but one or two really major primary ones, and interoperability occasionally needs to be tested at enormous hackathons and so forth. As an example of what you can do with it, I built some software for the New York Times to set up their Onion site. I thought, what if I tried using the same software to do a Wikipedia version? So I did, um, and it, this is the config file I wrote for the tool, which is called Enterprise Onion Toolkit, um, giving it a boring name because uh, I want boring people to use it. Um, and so that's your entire config file, which turns into a 94 kilobyte Nginx config, uh, but works. Like, I went from zero to Wikipedia as an Onion site in about half an hour. Um, and moreover, when I launched it to the world as a test, merely as a temporary test, because this was me acting on my own recognizance rather than with the blessing of Wikipedia. Um, I uh, borrowed some hardware, I set it all up, I got DDoSed by some people who thought it would be funny to try and take it out. They didn't succeed. It turns out Tor is, because of its anti-censorship heritage, extremely robust. And if you've got somebody who, behind it who's a reasonably experienced sysadmin who knows how to deal with resource loading and, you know, not die, um, it means you can have a very resilient website. I took it down, it was only like a, a week-long experiment, but it was fun and educational and I learned a lot by doing it. So if I had to summarize and bring this to a conclusion, um, why Onion? Well, you get to build uh, apps and tools and devices and you don't have to worry about NAT, you don't have to worry about firewalls or anything, and this works for people connecting inbound to your server so it ought to be, make sure you write your software securely. Um, but people will talk to your server even if your server is behind a firewall somewhere else. Uh, put it in an enclave, make it safe. Uh, you get extra access control, extra security and safety opportunities. You're guaranteed to be talking to the machine you intend to. Um, and it's also kind of fun, it's kind of hacky. It's like returning to the good old days of network experimentation. Uh, and and as finally, as an example of this, password-protected network interfaces are not something you get in the TCP IP world, as in ETH0 or HME0 or whatever it is, but you only know that it exists if you have a password. That is not part of the Layer 7 stack as applied to Ethernet and TCP IP. But inside Tor, what you do is you say, I have a hidden service directory which is going to hold all my key material, I'm called varlib HS1, uh, varlib Tor HS1, uh, I want it to forward port 22, and I want authorized clients, uh, basic, Alice, Bob, Charlotte, and Dave, and they each get special passwords which you distribute to them, and they are the only ones who can use that onion address. It gets mixed into the cryptography and inhibits anyone else using it. So you've got networking which is extremely uh, private to yourself for limited purposes, and other people won't even know that it's there, let alone be able to pollute the HSD in which they look things up in. So, if you've got a home webcam and you want to access it safely from anywhere on the planet, uh, and you don't want to worry about firewalls, and you don't want to worry about dynamic DNS changing your IP address every so often, or, you know, if it does, it's like a 10 or 20 minute issue until it heals itself, this is what you want. Thank you very much. Questions? Does Facebook mind that um, Facebook core.dub.dub.i thing? 
Yes, Facebook, mind the Facebook core, dub, 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 I, no, yes, the uh, onion address. We mined it and a lot of beer was drunk. Um, someone else <coughs> mind that as well? Um, that is a surprisingly large computation because it's um, well, 16 characters and each one represents five bits. Sure, but I'm sure so, like governments can bring that. No. <laughs> they, 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 well, actually you hit on a fair point. And the fair point is that that is a representation of the version 2 style onion address, uh, which is a SHA-1 hash of an RSA key. So an, a, a government hacker, a government authority, would have to create a functional RSA key um, arbitrarily from, you know, it's probably cheaper, cheaper to hire somebody to break into Facebook and steal a computer, frankly, because uh, it would be, able, it, you'd have to create a functional RSA key which when you SHA-1 hash it and then truncate the hash, looks exactly the same as that. And that's a really hard cryptographic problem. Because SHA-1 is, ah, yeah, that's right, because it's 160, so it's an 80-bit key, so. Um, that's rather big. But is it, is it harder than the original one that Facebook used? Well, this is the joke. As I say, we drank a lot of beer, we got an awful lot of computers and threw them to generating random ones. Uh, and we generated lots and lots of random ones, ran it for a week, grabbed the beer and grep, and went and found stuff that looked good. Uh, there were Facebook, we, we took anything which began with the word Facebook, and then threw away and, and all the rest. So, you know, it's looking in one into to the 40 to start with. That's right. Um, and um, yeah, it was, uh, th there were candidates with rude words in them and all sorts of other fun stuff. But we eventually found a good one. But, but so there's nothing that's, well, just because I typed google.com, google www, that could be Facebook, but my google www, there's no. Authentication that you're absolutely. Mm -hmm. You are absolutely correct. The question to, re or, or, to recap is, um, what faith do I have that Facebook Core WWI belongs to the real Facebook? And anyone who's ever seen domain hijacking happen on DNS has got the same problem. Um, the short version is in DNS land. Of course, you have lawyers and you have revocation and DNS servers and Ah, lawsuits and things. You don't get that in Onion Space. So trust has to become as an absolute. It has to come from Facebook mining it first, creating it and publishing it first, and so forth. Um, and it's backed up in the modern instance by the EV certificate, which is on the website. But otherwise, you're absolutely correct. Uh, they are just network addresses, and they could be fake as anything. Um, but having been created, the one thing you can guarantee is that it's a guaranteed fake because nobody else can create that. Question again. Did you say what an excellent talk that was actually? A very, a very good explanation of Tor and your network connection. Unfortunately, I've got to shoot it, but I would love to have a baby with you with something. Feel free to ping me. This man has details. Thank you very much indeed. Great talk. More questions? Um, one of the things that I always try to think about is how would I get my dad to use it? Um, trying to get him to understand that you can't just type in facebook.com anymore mm. is like one, but one challenge of hundreds. Um, and it seems to be a, like a big problem with decentralized tech as a whole is that actually people don't have a huge um, desire to actually move on to it because it doesn't really offer them any superpowers if they're not technical enough to understand what they're getting out of it. Um, in, in I guess the question is how do we fix that problem and get everyone using this? Uh, the, the question is, how do you make um, distributed technology and extra secure technology accessible for the masses? And the short version is you don't because you're looking at it as a tail wagging a dog. Uh, the proper way to look at it is what's called threat modeling. And if you have a challenge which benefits from this, use Tor as a technology to solve the problem. Um, one could, in the spirit of some hyper-enthusiastic, um, security-minded people I know, say, yes, absolutely everyone should load, get Tor browser and throw away all the other web browsers. What, the ones which have got all my bookmarks for all my family, and, and, and the ones that I watch all my porn on, and all the other things like that. So I should only use this one browser. Yeah, even though it occasionally drops all of its information because it's uh, you know, worried that I'm going to be snooped on and, you know, cookies. Yeah, you're absolutely right. 
On the other hand, if you are um, someone who does need to get the hell out of the network that they're currently on in order to achieve some end, you want to just fire up Tor. You, his, I, I analogize it to like cowboy movies where you go to some little homestead and there's always a shotgun over the fireplace. And the shotgun is usually called Bessie or something like that. And we only get it down from the fireplace when we need it. I use Tor in that way. I use uh, Firefox, I use Chrome, I use Safari. Tor is always, it's ever present on my um, laptop. If I'm on a train and they are blocking access to archive.is because I want to look up some newspaper clipping, and they're saying, we are not allowing you to look at this website because it's, you, it's a high bandwidth website that is used for file sharing. Fire up Tor, pff, end of problem. These blocks, these policy-based blocks are inhibiting legitimate communication. And we can argue about, well, they have a legitimate reason for the blocks too. Yeah, these are two kinds of legitimacy. Let them argue with each other. Again, to your point though, maybe if you are worried about your dad and you want to do, have a video link or something like that, and you want to make sure that it's not going to be um, leaked to some Chinese web server, or it's not going to wind up on AWS in a bucket which somebody is going to scrape one of these days, probably him, uh, and take all these pictures of your family and put them up on the internet. If you want to be absolutely guaranteed of having a connection from you to your dad's place, this. Other questions? Um, man in the blue shirt, who I've never seen before. Um, Tor now runs over IPv6 in the same way that it runs over IPv4. Uh, there is no nominal, no, no form of interoperation. It is like a skater on top of an ice rink. I'm oh, sorry, a, a gentleman behind you first. Yeah. I, uh, the qu question is, how does it compare to the Ethereum network? I have no idea. That's one of those blockchain things, isn't it? Yeah, no, and, and not my universe at all. I deal in live transactional data like TCP connections and streaming and sending packets back and forth over that. Gentleman in the red. Have you played with other overlay networks like Egressil, uh, uh, CJD, DMS, or uh, SSB? A long time ago, I fired up Freenet, was horrified, and switched it off. Apart from anything else, it was slow as anything. Um, I have friends who are uh, core contributors to ITP, I2P as well. Uh, but none of them have the scale that Tor does. Uh, w when I was the team lead and built the Onion site for Facebook, uh, it was in response to the fact that there many hundreds of thousands of legitimate normal people were accessing Facebook over Tor. When you've got a billion people or two billion people in the world, and some percentage of them are Tor users, let's say 0.1%, what's 0.1% of two billion? That's a big number. So you want to make an affordance to them for them to be able to use it. I2P simply doesn't have that level of traction, and I'm not aware of anything else that does. Well, I2P is slow because its purpose is to provide anonymity and storage. And uh, mm -hmm. there are a wide range of uh, over overlay networks which are essentially doing pretty much the same thing as you described in Tor, except for anonymity, which makes them much faster. Mm -hmm. Question, man in the blue, please. Um, in the last two or three slides, you mentioned the, the password. Could you could use the password at all? Uh, uh, so if I was asked or bot, how, how would I enter that password on using That password would be in your client's Tor configuration. And then how is it? Uh, and then, if I remember right, but don't hang me if I've got this wrong because Tor is a complex beast, um, it is part of the cryptography hand wave, uh, which serves to put data into the HSDR. So it's not possible to get a hold of the descriptors which allow me access to uh, the remote website. You can't get to me without having the right password. Presently, um, when you come out of the lift, you have to turn right 
get out the back door and then turn right again, and you should see it just opposite the other side of the road. Um, so yeah, we'll all be we'll be in there presently. But for now, thank you very much, Alex. Thank you.